Let me turn that thing on. So 2 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3 today. For those of you who weren't here next Wednesday, which is the 15th, you're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and either write what sticks out to you or write what it means to you. Then you're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and do the same thing. <coughs> if there's one verse that sticks out to you, if there's four verses, whatever. If there, you know, and like... Um, any of you guys that were in here when uh, when Charlie was still uh, not in privileges, dude, he would just write whatever was on his heart. You know what I mean? And it it generally would relate to the text. That's all I'm asking for. That's all I'm, I'm not asking for no Einstein breakdown. You know what I mean? I'm not yes, asking God. for Pastor Tom or Pastor John from Faith, Hope, and Love breakdown of the Scripture, man. Just write what you get. Write what you think. What it makes you think of. What it makes you feel. Right. You'll be able to watch a movie uh, Wednesday the next day you're about to watch TV. <laughs> Today? After Georgia? <laughs> well, we're going an hour over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> After this, we got clock time. Yeah. I thought, see, that's what that's what's been weirding me out. So three weeks ago, he said, y'all's schedule is changing. Start coming at 7, and I, they're not going to have quiet time. So Rule 76. 76. That's what he told me. <laughs> Seven, he started, he said, your class will be from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. They will not have a quiet time. They'll just go straight into chores because you guys wouldn't be home. He said not everybody will be home by that. What's the group put that sticky note on his desk? Uh, I just told Larry today, um, and I'm telling you guys the same thing what I just said earlier, I'm going to start coming at 6 p.m. Because if you guys are already here, like, I don't mind it, but, dude, I've been up since 3.30. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I am more out, bro. You know, I even told Rachel that I'm like, if I sit here any longer, I'm gonna fall asleep and I won't make it. Because <laughs> I was gonna wait and drive her truck, but she didn't get done in time. You know, I was thinking about bringing Onyx with me today, but I keep forgetting that the mother dogs are gone. It would have been cool to see her eat, eat a boxer. Yeah. <laughs> she's about the size of them dogs. She's only nine weeks. She's half her size. Anyway, so Second Corinthians one, two, and three. Um, and I, this is what, like last week when I was telling you guys to go ahead and do chapter 3, um, I got two sentences for chapter 1. It's more or less like an introductory chapter. So that's why we're doing 1, 2, and 3. Then we're going back to the two chapters, right? Anybody want to do one? Well, I actually got it for all three. You wrote all yours together? Well, I wrote that much. What I'm saying is, did you read I all three one, chapters? I got and, one for chapter one, chapter two. Okay, so you divide it? Okay. All right. so just two. just chapter one. All right. I put, God is the ultimate source of comfort, and he also wants to give us comfort through others. But we need to remember he is the ultimate and amazing comfort that we as humans need. Yes. He is, man. Like, he's, whenever, okay, so like, before I became a Christian, Whenever something happened to me, or especially if it was something bad, you know what I mean? Like, I turned to drugs, or I turned, I tried to turn to other people, uh, mainly women, you know what I mean? Um, every now and then, I would turn to my mom and dad and, and actually say something to them, but that was very rare, you know what I mean? And it, nothing ever helped. Nothing ever really changed anything. But then when I started reading the Bible, started praying, started seeking God's face, and I literally started turning to him first, that doesn't mean that I don't seek out spiritual guidance from other people anymore. That just means that I turned to him first. And dude, all of a sudden it's like things just start falling into place. And I feel more at peace now than I've ever been. Ever. You know what I'm saying? Anybody else got chapter one? I do. Is that a feather pin? Man. <laughs> Sorry, it takes me a while to notice these things, you guys. I'm, you know, now I'm only here one day a week. Who said go? Derek raised it. Oh, Derek. First, what Second, I got Corinthians, out, I got Second Corinthians 1. I don't mind on 1 6. What I got out of this was that if you're trying your best to walk in sight, please know God. Things still aren't going exactly the way you want them to go, even though you're not realizing it. Yes, it is. And, like, they write songs about that. They write sermons about that. Like, that's a big thing. Like, you hear you hear Christians say that all the time. Even when you don't see it, he's working. 
especially when you don't see it. He's working. You know what I mean? Sometimes answer is no, though. Sometimes. <laughs> Just because he can don't mean he will. That's why there's not a like, pearl white Corvette sitting in the driveway right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Rachel the other day, I'm never going to stop asking for that. One day. I'm telling you, Robert, one day. It might be an 84 <laughs> with 400,000 miles, barely start, with one of them tune port, 120 horsepower, crappiest Corvette ever made, but it's going to be white and it's going to be mine. Oh, yeah, we yeah. dropped Waylon off at uh, yeah. the hospital, and on the, the we, as we were coming out of the parking lot, I look over and on the windshield it says God's gift, and I look, I'm like God gave you a Honda. Like, <laughs> like, uh, hey, Honda. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. When you don't have anything, Amen. dude. I, like how many times, Robert? You probably remember me telling this story. How many times I uh, said it because we didn't get to go outside much until my trustee because they never had enough employees. But I'd be at the annex, and the, at the annex in Sevier County, you can see part of Highway 66 right there in front of Lowe's and Kroger. Dude, I can't tell you. I mean, I wouldn't be saying it out loud, but I'm thinking in my head, man, I can't wait till it's my turn to be back out there. Number one, I didn't have a license, so in my head, I've got this like this scenario playing out, me riding in the passenger seat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm I'm coming to know Christ, and I'm like, I ain't gonna break the law anymore, just drive. And I didn't. Thank you, Jesus. You know what I mean? That could have railroaded me. Any any small compromise could railroad you, but He's always working, man. He's always working. Then one day, I don't think anybody was in here. My so, I came here in April, and it was right April of 2020. It was either the very end of January or the very beginning of February the following year. I hadn't graduated yet. I finally got my license back. It cost me $1,800. Um, luckily, the government sent us a $1,400 check. Right? <coughs> they sent us that check during COVID. My dad held on to that mine? My dad held on to mine. And I phased up. So, I phased up into four phase. On Christmas that year, Christmas 2020. So I started paying stuff off, you know what I mean, using that uh, go the government check that they give me or whatever, right? So by 1st of February, um, I had my license back, and my cousin Chris, without me knowing it, because I hadn't been talking to him much, he texted me one day, and he was like, duh, 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 how you doing, bro? I ain't seen you in a while. Um, he's the general manager of Melting Pot, which is part of the company I work for, all right? And I'm like, bro, got my license back. Da, da, da. He's like, man, I just went and bought a new car. You want to buy mine? So I bought his. He had a black 2010 Nissan Altima. Oh, yeah. 21 days later, the transmission went out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick's told me $3,800 is going to be the cheapest. And the car wasn't even worth that. You know what I mean? He sold me that car for 20 I think he gave me $2,400 for it. He gave me half my money back. He was like, man, I didn't know I was going to do that. Or I wouldn't have sold it to you. He was like, something, something, something about the money. I was like, dude, I was like, man, I ain't even, I'm not even asking you for the money back because it sells a sale. I was like, but if you give me half of it back, I'd at least have a down payment on the car. He said, I'll do that right now because he done went and spent some of it on rent. He bought a 2017 Maxima. He went and bought rims for it and everything. For my money. <laughs> but God's working, bro. Even when you don't think about it, man. Like, I'm telling you, that, that my first nine months in here. Are you talking about Chris? <clears throat> Chris Osborne. Yeah, yeah, we, that's yeah. my cousin, right? Yeah, you know, um, hey, hey, Chris, fucking Chris. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wasn't even really thinking about that. You know what I mean? Like coming in through here, like you guys were thinking about getting our IDs back, getting our social security cards back, <coughs> and then all of a sudden I, I turned around. And it was ten months later. I had a car and everything. God's like, <laughs> I'm like hey, all right. Like, I probably would have rather had a Honda. I'd still be driving that. I wouldn't have had to go spend more money on another car. You know what I mean? But, either a Honda or a Toyota. Oh, man. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? First of all, nice day. Yeah. My dad used to, because I, I love Fords, man. That's why I'm going to get me a truck Lord. again. Next He's subject, like, please. Found on the road dead. Hey, I He's remember, like, found on the road dead. I remember, because uh, I remember, what was it? Uh, that uh, that was it. His mom, it was then his mom passed away. Chris's? Yeah. Uh uh. Or then she had a minivan that she gave Chris and he donated it. Yeah. To uh, recovery trails. Um. Yeah, that's Toby's. Toby's. Yeah. Uh, Toby. Um, you know Toby? 
Yeah. Sure. Um, like he's a good friend of my mom and dad. I don't. It wasn't Chris's. Chris's mom didn't pass away, but somebody did. His aunt or somebody. That's who it was. His, his aunt. aunt. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Because uh, that's how I met Toby and him. Is uh, when I first got out, Chris was like, "Are you going to rehab? Are you going to rehab? Are you going to rehab?" I'm like, "Yeah, eventually." And he's like, "Stop come to NA meetings with me." So me and him were going to NA meetings every week, and that's where I met Toby. <clears throat> and they even tried to get me into there. And I, I told my house that's here. Yeah, yeah, over here. Yeah. And yeah. I told yeah. my probation officer, I'm like, look, man, True Purpose is good and all, but this other place, they're like faith-based too. And he goes, man, did you play sports when you was in school? I said, yeah, I played basketball. He said, did you want to play the worst kid on the team every day and just whoop him, or did you want to play the best kid on the team every day and get better? And I went, Fine. <laughs> Not to say anything about Toby's program, but at the time it was a fresh start program. You know what I'm saying? It's still the same way, but and you go with it's just true purpose. Well, he was like, true purpose is the best player on the team. Fine. Uh, <laughs> I'll go to true purpose. <laughs> and I, here I am. You know what I mean? Ernest McMahon? Yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah, he's yeah. by the other house on the yeah, other side. He has two of them. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Brad McGill was in there. Yeah. Yeah. Nick King was in there. Yeah. There's all my colleagues, man. Yeah. TJ, TJ Gentry was in there. Yeah. 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 A lot of them are. Most of them are locked back up. <laughs> I, hate to say, I hate to say it. You know what I mean? But Yeah, you got to you <laughs> find your way. You know what I mean? Toby's going through a learning process, too. You know what I mean? Like he, like literally, his place has only been open not even two years. That place only been around because I've been well, maybe a little more than two years because it opened whenever I decided I was going to come here in 2020. That's when it opened, so it's been open almost three years. So you got to think, man, it's a process. You know what I mean? You don't just start out hitting home runs, bro. Yeah. You know, Kyle, you want to do chapter one? Yeah, I wrote mine on one nine. Uh, it said, "God is faithful to who." From who you were called in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, good. It talks about Paul like, struggling and going through trials and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Paul went through trials just as we did, and he will. God will use that to strengthen our faith in him. He allows us to endure those difficult times to let us know that we're not in control anymore. He can and he will pull us out when we cast everything mm -hmm. to him. The difficult times that we face and the difficult times that we go through are almost always that may not be the it's not the only reason but it's always going to have something to do with perseverance you know what i'm saying like like god's god's never promised us not one time that our life is going to be easy when we come to know as a matter of fact he promises the opposite of that he says you will be persecuted it never stops it never stops, never stops. Never stops. it never stops but like you were saying like you were saying, he once we turn to him, you know what I'm saying? He's always working for us, and he always comforts us, dude. And it makes it so much like it makes it so much easier. You're not coping with problems or covering problems up. You're hitting them head on, and you're changing them. You're fixing them. You're not just dealing with it, and you're not hiding it or or shying away from it. You're literally facing your issues, and you're changing them to where they're not a problem. <laughs> That's God. Right. I only got, I wrote, like I said, I wrote two things down. Um, I can never read my own writing. <laughs> Paul wrote this letter um, when he found out that some of the church leaders in Corinth <coughs> still denied that he was a genuine apostle of Christ. So at some point, Paul found out that so he started this church, right? He found out that some of the people that had made their way into the leadership roles were telling other people that Paul wasn't a genuine apostle. So he starts to write this letter, right? This letter is his vindication. This is him saying, oh, yeah? Well, yeah. how about this, 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 and this, this? That's what this letter's really about, you know what I mean? Um, Didn't they accuse him of like stealing church money and all kinds of stuff? I don't remember. Um... That may have been an issue because it's, there was there's at least once in the New Testament where he talks about the money and he says, well, I've got, I've got, it ain't just me, it's him and him too. That way nothing can be said. So it might have been because of something like that. You know what I mean? Um, so he talks about comfort and suffering, right? Uh, 
And the reason, okay, so just before writing this letter, and you can read about this in Acts chapter 19, if you want to know more about it. Just before writing this letter, Paul is in the city of Ephesus, which is the church that he wrote the letter of Ephesians to, right? He's in the city of Ephesus, and they start a riot, and they almost, this dude almost, I mean, all throughout the New Testament, he almost dies like 12 times. They nearly killed him. They nearly killed him. He, it, it's a near-death experience that he has during a riot in the city of Ephesus. And again, you can read about that in Acts chapter 19. And so this is like fresh in his brain, right? This literally just happened to him. He gets to, to wherever, he, wherever he was when he wrote this letter. I don't think he stayed in Ephesus. He went somewhere else. Um, so he starts talking about how you can find comfort in God, even while you're suffering, right? Dude's like literally almost just lost his life. And he's still talking about finding comfort in God in the midst of suffering, right? God is the God of comfort. Just like he did. You good? No. Okay. Every time you raise them glasses up, I know something's coming. Yeah. <laughs> you're thinking over there, bro. If you need to say something, man, go ahead, bro. Yeah. It's also, you know, with this, this, uh, you know, you hear hear a lot, guys, about spreading discord and dissension, and that's exactly what's happening in this church. Yes. And that's why there is a lot of no, a zero policy. I mean, you might get warned for it, but that's why it's so important, because that's what the devil is wanting: is separation of you guys. You know, God's ordained for you to be here. You may not see it now, you know, guys. Some of you that's been here might not see it, but God's got you here for that reason. Because of the calling that's on your life, and this is this is the preparation, this is the, the training grounds for it, and you got to be careful, you know, in the transformation phase of it. You can't you can't let your mouth override your blessings either, because you can block everything that God's got planned for you by sitting down, and letting the devil take over your tongue, and speaking death over your brothers. That's discord and dissension also. And that's a lot of what this chapter is about, yep. is is worrying about other people and not yourself and your own walk. Yep. And see, he's worried about, the, the leaders worry about what Paul's doing. They're trying to shut Paul down to advance themselves. And uh, when you do that, you know, God will reverse them blessings on you because he says he'll take, he gives and he takes away. Yep. So be careful what you do when you walk and what you say about people. Yeah. In, in, yeah. In and in, in this program, if you see, if you see that in people, the epistles, the letters, are a great place, especially Corinthians um, and Philippians, to learn how to deal with that kind of action amongst you. If you look in the mirror and you and you feel in your heart that you're the person spreading the discord, you know what I mean? A, a lot of times when we're doing it, we're blind to it. Mm -hmm. But if you actually stop for a minute and realize, man, am I, am I breaking them down or am I building them up? Read the epistles, especially Corinthians, especially Philippians kind of give you the guidance, man, the advice, the godly advice that you need to help straighten that up. Right? Mm -hmm. Who wants to do chapter 2? I put, we can find ourselves in time thinking that what is going on in our life is too much and we don't know how we will find a way out. That is the reason we need to trust God and that's why he wants so, or that's what he wants so we will be ready and able for what the future holds. Like, I know everybody that's sitting in this room has heard, oh, I'm in my head. Well, I'm in my head. Well, I'm in my head. Dude, that's kind of a dangerous place to be sometimes. Yeah. Because it, and I, I taught a class on this, I think, Robert, didn't I? Uh, so science has proved that your thoughts are held by the proteins in your body. Yeah. Which means, technically speaking, you never forget anything. Every thought you've ever had is held in a protein in your body somewhere. It's like muscle memory. But it's like muscle memory. When you're thinking about negative stuff, all these proteins activate, so it's negative, negative, negative. Now all of a sudden, you hear people talk about being depressed, and they're like, I feel heavy. I just feel the weight of the world on me. It's a literal physical <coughs> thing because you're thinking about negative things all the time. You know? If we can learn to, if we can learn to trust in God, even when we're going through something, like when my car was all messed up, 
You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, it's getting ready to be seven degrees outside. I'm on this bag of motorcycle. I got heated gear that was like half price. <laughs> I mean, I ain't gonna lie about it. I bought the half price stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I don't have a whole lot of money. So I'm like, man, it, you know, it says it works at negative 20 degrees. Nope. <laughs> 20 degrees is it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like I, over and over in my head, dude, I'm dwelling on it, dwelling on it, dwelling on it. And I'm short with people at work. I'm short. I can I can tell when I'm like stressing out over something. And finally, I have to force myself sometimes to be like, dude, just stop. Because has he not come through every single time? Boom, Rachel gets a week off work. The, the week that it was like 4 degrees, 5 degrees, 7 degrees, 3 days in a row, they they were like, uh, Rachel, if you don't use your vacation time, you're fixing to lose it. She had a week off. <coughs> <Call her. coughs> or my boss let me borrow their truck for five weeks. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, we got a work truck that we don't even use right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Chevy 2500 HD, baby. Hallelujah. You know? <laughs> you was you in here then? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That was cool, man. <laughs> Like, God comes through, right? We just have to learn to trust. And it's hard, man. I'm, I've been doing this for four years. I, some of you guys have been Christians way longer than me. You know what I'm saying? But I have four years of experience that I can look back on and say, man, you would think that I would automatically do it every time, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't automatically trust in God. We have to continually put it into practice, right? We have to continually put it into practice. So even if, it even if you if it takes you an hour or a day or a week to get it in your head, whatever it is going on, I'm going to trust in God and give it to Him. You know what I mean? But uh, going through that and going through things, so God's going to allow that as a test of faith yeah. and a test of your walking. And yeah. if you're going to turn your eyes to Him and stay on Him, or or you're going to go about your own will and your own way and yeah. stop out of His will. But you know a better way. That's our, yeah. our human nature. And, it, and it's, again, it's it's not so much for God. It is, but it's for us. It's for because us. on the back end of it, you're going to be like, man, I, I ran that race with endurance. Mm -hmm. I didn't give up. Mm -hmm. And it feels great, man. It feels great. Kyle, was you wanting to do chapter two? Yeah. I, got, I wrote mine on 10 through 11. Unforgiveness will tear you apart from the inside out, and then everything around you. It's easy to forgive others and ask for it, but it's even harder to forgive yourself. <clears throat> Come on. We shouldn't carry that in our hearts as we move forward in this walk of Christ. So I think it's in Matthew chapter 6, maybe. He says, If you do not forgive others, my Father who is in heaven will not forgive you. Jaw dropper. Jaw. I mean, think about that. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? Back up. If you do not forgive others, and do you think if we take it literally? Yes, pretty much all of Scripture can be taken literally. Okay, there is certain parts of Scripture which is like, um, like spiritual, um, descriptive, like stuff. But pretty much everything in Scripture is actually literal as well. All right, just so everybody knows that. Um, so he says, if you do not forgive others, so we take that literally, <laughs> but it's like Kyle said, isn't it, for me it was, isn't it harder to forgive yourself than it is other people? It is. Like truly? It's easier to ask and then forgive others, but then when you want to forgive <laughs> yourself, it's like you're stuck. Like there has been some things that I've found that I held on to longer than others from other people. You know what I mean? But like, it was way harder to forgive myself for some of the things I did, to especially like my kids. Or the mother of my children at the time. Because now that I see, now that I see relationships the way God intended them to be, two becoming one, dude, I could have ruined her. I could have ruined her eternity. I could have ruined her eternity. You know? My kids, I could have ruined theirs. Like, by all means, they should be in the trap house right now. That's all they knew growing up, because that's all I did. I didn't force them like some of my friends. Their parents was actually getting them high. I didn't do that. You know what I mean? But I didn't want, I didn't like, I didn't, <laughs> you know? Like, I was crazy. Like, dumb, dumb. So I was ignorant, you know what I mean? But, dude, God comes through, man. And like Robert said, he's got a calling on each one of you guys. 
Now, I, I don't want you guys to think like, so when somebody says there's a calling on your life, it doesn't always mean preacher or, you know what I mean? I don't want you guys to think, oh, or, you know, standing in front of a whole bunch of people, if you're not comfortable with that, that's not what you're calling to me. But God has something for you to do for the kingdom that nobody else can do. And that's why you're here. That's why you're here. And God's a God of completion. So if you don't see it through to the end, he's not going to give it to you. Right? So think about how important it is to see this through, man. Because now, like, dude, it's crazy. It's crazy. My kids hold their hands up and praise God. Uh, I met a, a wife, my wife, Rachel. I met a girl that I never would have pictured in a million years that I would be married to, ever. We worked together like 18 years ago, and that was pretty much it. I remember the last time she saw me, she ran. It was like at a Dollar General in Sevierville or something. And I was like, Rachel, is that you? And she's like, I can say it all. I'm like, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Rachel. And she's like, <laughs> I was like, her middle name must be Pew. <laughs> she was gone. I'm like, dang, she's fast. I was like, I didn't even turn around. I was still in the baby room. I turned around, she was gone. I wasn't going to eat it. But like, never in a million years, bro. And here I am. Here she is. God is good, man. That's all I know. God is good. You just got to let him do it. You got to do your part too, right? So I got in a fight. I got into an argument with a guy at the gym about once saved, always saved. Mm. He come in, I come in the gym, put my bag down by the window, go in the bathroom to see how fat I am every time I go to the gym. And he's in there. He's like, hey, buddy. I'm like, hey, brother. I don't know if he's seen my cross. I don't know because I'm pretty sure I had a shirt on. I was taking my shirt off and I had because it was kind of cold outside that day. He said, where do you go to church? New Hope. He's like, oh, yeah, New Hope in Kodak, man. He's like, cool, give me a verse for today. It's okay. <laughs> Second Peter 2 20. He's like, I don't know that. And I was like, it's the uh it's the um doctrine of perseverance. It has to do with once saved, always saved. What? <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> He's like, well, I'm a Baptist. He's like, well, I worship in a Baptist church, but I'm a Christian. And we believe wholeheartedly in once saved, always saved. And I agree, like we had a class on that. Yeah. The Bible supports both. <laughs> Well, the Bible's a paradox, right? It supports that, and it supports, you better watch out, perseverance, the doctrine of perseverance, right? And I thought I'd never get out of that bathroom. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, really? He's like, no, 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 about the commission, about our mission, this, that, and other. I'm like, the commission is to make disciples. What are you talking about? Once saved, always saved. That's our mission. You know, like, he wasn't making much sense to me, and I saw myself getting aggravated. And I was like, man, I was like, cool. I was like, if that's what you believe, that's what you believe. I said, read Hebrews chapter 6. <laughs> and I walked out of the bathroom. I thought, I'm like to fight this old man. He's a Baptist. That's why. <laughs> but, but Jesus says it no more plainly than faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Yeah. Oh, that's what he said. He said, so do you you believe that uh, that our God would take your salvation away? And I'm like, are you dumb right now? No. Did I say that? Did I say our God will take it from us? No. Like I wanted to paint this picture for him. About salvation being a prison. I don't want to get, uh, we'll get into it later right, after class or something. But salvation is a gift, right? If I give you a gift and you set it on your desk and go about your day and you don't never open it, how do you know what that gift is? You have to accept it, right? You have to accept it. So if he's saying, I want saved, always saved, what you're saying is, if you accept that gift, you can never reject it. So what about the people that reject it right off the rip? That means they can never accept it? Your theology does not hold water. Right? I wanted to go in, and I'm like, man, I'm trying to work out. And then afterwards, I noticed he kind of followed me around with him. And uh, he didn't say nothing else about it, but he's like, ah, oh, no, no, talk good. What? You know? I'm like, man. Like, he didn't. I, I didn't. I was like, man, I wasn't trying to fight with you, bro. He got mad about it. He was heated. He was like, well. I'm like, he's heated. But at least I got to talk about Jesus at the gym. Amen. Right? All right, anyway, I don't know what made me get off on that. That was just fun. I can't believe that happened to me. So we got, what, about 20 minutes? So I'll go ahead and, does anybody else want to do chapter 2? Anybody else want to read what they got for chapter 2? No? 
Okay. So here's I got a few things. Chapter two, I got more out of chapter two than either of the other ones. So in First Corinthians, <laughs> I believe it's chapter five. In First Corinthians chapter five, Paul addresses an issue that the Corinthian church is having, and it is specifically with an incestuous person within the church. Mm-hmm. And they are allowing this person to be a part of the church without addressing that issue, mm-hmm. right? So here again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he again addresses this same incestuous person. Um, it is also thought, just so you guys know, and I've said this before, it is thought, and pretty much all biblical scholars agree on this, I'm pretty sure, that in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, um, Paul wrote a third letter to the Corinthians, and the and the reason why they pretty much know this to be true. So, like I said, this bless you. This instance is something that he wrote about in First Corinthians chapter five. Well, here in Second Corinthians chapter two, he starts referencing things that he told them, but it's not in First Corinthians, yeah. right? So there had to be another letter to them somewhere, probably about this this guy, this incestuous guy, right? So Paul is referencing things that are not mentioned in 1 Corinthians here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, okay? And the people who at that time were upholding this incestuous person and letting them be a part of the church without addressing that issue had since took Paul's advice and turned against him as far as, um, as far as like corrective action, all right? And I'm pretty sure in 1 Corinthians Paul said, listen, if he's not willing to admit that what he's doing is wrong and try to come to um, a point where he can fix that, he needs to go because he's one bad apple ruins the whole bear, a bushel, right? Or however that saying goes. Basket, that's bread, whatever. <laughs> Dang it, Robert. I'll get it right eventually, you know. So he says you need to, you need to ask them to leave. Or get them out of your church, because that's poison. That's poison. Well, here, finally, in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, they have taken Paul's advice. Um, so, um, again, I wrote something about uh, his near-death experience in a thesis. It's hard for me to read my writing. Okay, so in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, Paul is talking about being distressed, being in anguish, and being in tears. I don't believe, I would have to, I don't, um, I don't think at this time he starts mentioning the thorn in his side. So it's pretty much specifically these, these emotions that he's going through have to do with his near-death experience <laughs> in that riot that he's just come out of, out of pieces, right? Um, also in chapter 2, Paul, in verses 14 and 16, Paul mentions or talks about the smell of death and the fragrance of life. Right? This refers to a Roman triumph where the general leads his armies and the prisoners of war in a festive procession or a parade, right? The soldiers get to return home and be celebrated. The prisoners, on the other hand, are facing death, right? Or, at at best, slavery. Mm -hmm. So when the prisoners would smell the incense during the parade, they would call it the smell of death. Because when, when, by that time, there's no turning back, right? There's, when they got you locked up, you're a prisoner of war, and you start smelling the incense, and they're having a party and throwing a parade, they would tell, they would say to each other, "Well, there's the smell of death, right?" Christians are led victoriously by Christ, right? It's through Christ and the church that God spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. The spread of the gospel is always received as a sweet smell, 
right? Or a celebration of life. Heck, uh, Hebrews 4 tells you that the, the word itself is a life. Mm -hmm. The word itself is a life bringer. Right? The word, like, I'm trying to think, I might have to look it up. But, um, so one of the, one of the, um, I want to say Greek, but I can't remember if it was Greek or Aramaic. I'll have to look it up. One of the old words used in the New Testament um, for the word of, or the, the gospel actually means vitality, which is um, like motion, like, you know what I'm saying? Like literal, literal, like vibration or, um, or literal being alive. Hovered. Hovered. Well, that's... The Spirit of God hovered. Yeah, that, hovered that's vibrating. Um, there's another one. There's another word though that they use in the New Testament that means the same thing. I'll have to look it up. It, mean, it, mean, it don't mean it don't that the word for hovered over the waters means to quake or vibrate. Yeah. The word I'm thinking of means vitality, like more, like literally the essence of life, and it's saying it about the Word of God. Yeah, I'll look it up. It's in the New Testament. So. So, so here you have Paul talking about the smell of death, which is for, for like prisoners of war. And again, like I was saying earlier, we, you do get some spiritual imagery in, in uh, Scripture. If you think about it, um, at some point, the people that never accepted Christ in their hearts are going to be smelling the smell of death, right? And at some point, Christians... Are going to be smelling the fragrance of life, which is the presence of God. Right? Um, so, as Christians, we will be smelling the celebration of life. However, to those who reject Christ, uh, that that same smell, okay, the same smell that we smell as the celebration of life, when they smell it, it's going to be the smell of death. Think about that. Not that smell that you smell. <laughs> <laughs> He goes, woo! <laughs> Who wants to do chapter 3? DJ? We need to stay focused and know that the process takes time. And as we are born again, we will see that our thoughts and actions and choices are changing for the better. Yes. And God, God actually starts with the intentions of your heart. True transformation happens in the heart. And... When the reasons why you do what you do start to change, the the way you think can't it has to change with it, right? It has to. That's why I said, like if you look in Galatians chapter five, uh, right here, Galatians chapter five, chapter uh, five, verse twenty-two, he's talking about the fruit of the spirit. Um, self control is the last one. It's always the last one. You know what I'm saying? It, it's it's something that, again, is a process that takes time, practice, perseverance, and endurance. Right? Which is, man, we should be marathon runners. Could you imagine having to do it in chain mail, though? Like you said, David had put, David put on glass helmet, or, man, there ain't no, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that dude had a little bitty body. Big old head. Big yeah. old body. <laughs> got more head than he's got body. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Kyle, you want to do three? <coughs> yeah, it was, it was such a short chapter. Like I didn't it is it. pretty short. It's only about four paragraphs. But what stuck out to me was um, 14, yeah. 14 through 15. It says, But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. And then it talks about like in the lessons of the day of atonement when the high priest would go in and they would have bells on his garment. Yep. And then uh, they'd tie a rope around his ankle yeah. just in case they Because if they weren't they, right with God, if they, they weren't purified, dude, they would die. Dude. And then they'd pull him Drag out. Drag him out, right? I thought that was kind of crazy. Yeah. But, it is but crazy. he's talking about the veil right there. And I, I wrote something about this. And we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, he's specifically talking about the letter of the law compared to um, the law of the Holy Spirit or what the Holy Spirit brings or what Jesus Christ brought. Right? Did you fight? Did you? Are you talking about uh, uh, Ragaz? I'm pretty sure it's on my phone, so I'll get on there and look. But it it's that means trembling, standing in. It's awe. talking about the word of God, 
And the, the word that they use specifically means vitality. Vitality. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna look, I'll, we'll look it up on the phone. And vita like vitality means like like actual motion. Vitality means motion. You know what I mean? Like not not just to be aware, but to be to be uh, um like ready to go. You know what I mean? Action. Right? But the word of God <laughs> bring brings you into action. Right? Just like the love of God. Which say was never a word until the New Testament users started using it. Agape, which is the Greek word for the love of God, is love and action, 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 action. Right? Did you find something wrong? The Hebrew word for vitality is likewise. It, uh, it means the meaning of life, meaning life. Meaning life. Mm -hmm. I'll look. I'll look it up just to, just to make sure to ease my mind because now now I can't remember what the heck I what the heck I'm thinking of. But I know that's what it means. It it doesn't mean like. It doesn't mean it just brings you to some kind of knowledge or something like that. It means it brings you into some kind of transforming action to others. Right? Anyway, anybody else want to do three? Who else? I got a little something. something. <laughs> um, I did mine on what he was reading. Second Corinthians three fifteen <clears throat> says, uh, "Even when until this day, whenever Moses, the book of Moses, was read, the veil rise over their hearts." And I even had to talk to Chip about this, right? About learning. So they know the book of Moses that. The back of their hand, yeah. that veil was over their eyes. They're not walking it out in the spirit. The spirit right. in constant contact with God. They think they got to do it through the law and <coughs> obey the law. But basically, what I got out of it was, uh, you know, they still believe that the law is the only way to God, and Christ is the only way that the veil can be lifted. We now walk with the spirit and not bound by Old Testament laws. Because I keep getting. My mind wrapped around the Bible so much and brought Bible verses and reading and reading and reading. When part of this relationship with God is walking with Him in the Spirit, too. Not yep. just all these book reading. Yep. There's you know, more to it. Yeah. There's a, there's a big difference between book smart and street smart, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like spiritual street smart. Yes. Walking with there's God. A, there is a definitive difference between book smart and street smart. Yeah. You can be Bible smart, you can be spiritual smart. There's knowledge and wisdom, right? Doesn't Paul even say right there, uh, either in, you was talking about verse 15, so either right before that or right after that, he says, the letter of the law, she kills. It says it right in there, the letter will kill you. <laughs> Wait a minute, what? <laughs> he just said the Bible's going to kill me. <laughs> no, but it brings death because you can't live up to it. You can't live up to it, and if you're not trained, if you're not spiritually secure, if you don't have the armor of God on, you're going to start condemning yourself. Right? That's what he means. Does anybody else want to read three? Because I wrote about this, right? Um, so, um, at the start of chapter three, some people are asking Paul, why doesn't he bring letters of uh, commendation with him? And he's like, hmm. <laughs> he's like, okay, let me go to the church that I started and get a letter of recommendation from myself. That's pretty much what he's thinking in his head, right? He's like, man, the church is my letter of recommendation or commendation. Or my, my, the church is my evidence of my spirit and who I am, right? Um, the church itself was Paul's letter. So this... When Paul, Paul starts the chapter out like that, this leads to him to start to talk about the contrast of the letter of the law, which was the written law, or the law of Moses. Um, and eventually, at some point in the Old Testament, they had 613 laws. It went from 10 commandments to 613 laws, right? So these laws were written on stone. But Paul is... Paul is... Um, um, affirming what Jesus taught that through him it will be written on your heart, right? Mm -hmm. So these these aren't laws that I'm going to write on the stone that you have to learn by saying them over and over and over again. These are laws that are going to be written on your heart that you don't have to do anything. You just naturally act on them. Right? One is the letter of the law. One is the spirit. He even talks about um, when they read the law of Moses that it will put a bill over their heart or a cover it will cover their heart because they don't measure up. Romans tells us that none of us, all of us fall short of the glorious standard of God, right? So when you start reading that, you're like, man, 
like, dude, am I really this big a piece of crap? Yes, but. <laughs> my dad used to say, how big are you? 6'1", 240. But no, they made pieces of crap that big. Yeah, it's bad. Like that 1974 wants their jokes back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was like, I was born in 58, never mind. <laughs> you know any jokes when you were born? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's crazy. One of them is the land of the law, one of them is the spirit. <laughs> right? So don't let it, we have to be, we have to be um, wise enough to know that every single day of your life is going to be a constant challenge to walk out that letter. When you were reading, I specifically wrote down, and I believe this is in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus himself says, if you're going to live by the law, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Zealots, the Sadducees, all these, all these religious people, that Jewish people that you see right now, they're going to the synagogue, they're priests, they live there practically. Your, your righteousness must exceed that if you ever want to enter the gates of heaven. He said, but if you follow me and do it in spirit, and that does it not say that God is spirit in John chapter 4? Yeah. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? One is unto death. The written law is unto death. The spiritual law is unto life. Because Jesus brings us true life, right? When we reflect Christ, so when we, when people look at us and they are seeing the reflection of Christ in us, we are changed from glory to glory to glory to glory in his image, right? So don't be discouraged. And every man in this, every man in this room has broke them laws dozens, hundreds, thousands of times. Don't let that discourage you and, and bring condemnation. You are worthy for the gift God has given you. Open it. Open it. Don't leave it sit on the nightstand. Don't hide it behind some snicker, Snickers can't. Don't open it. Right? Well, what? I love Snickers. <laughs> I don't know why I was still in Baby Ruth that one day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, maybe I got this wrong. I don't remember that kind of story. Right? But when the Jews were in the desert, right at, when they left Egypt, didn't they basically beg for that law? Like, didn't they tell Moses, like, well, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, you know, blah, blah. And then Moses was like, all right, I'm going to go find out. And then you come down with the Ten Commandments. Um, so they weren't begging him for the laws. They were, however, confused because they had just spent their entire four, six, eight generations of, of life in slavery to the Egyptians. So Moses is like, come on, let's go. And they finally get away, and they're looking around, and they're like, crap, it's like getting out of jet. Like, you go get locked up for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and get out. Well, Even three know. was kind of weird. You know what I'm saying? People are paying, <laughs> people are paying for stuff that stored their phone, and it's beeping, and I'm like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? I'm like, that's crazy. Stop. I look outside to make sure cars ain't flying. <laughs> you know? You talking about Shannon Gill? Yes. I mean, I do that now. But like, hell, yeah. I remember the first time I seen that when I got home. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What you just do there? Yeah. How'd you pay for that? Why you see I was like, is Trump still president? What's he doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but anyway, imagine what it would feel like to now. Actually, we don't have to imagine. We know exactly what it's like for our life to be completely turned around. You, you're doing it right now. You were so comfortable in the darkness. It didn't hurt your eyes, did it? Darkness never hurt your eyes. Then you come into the light. Like, ah! Where you going? Come on. You come down them stairs, you better be careful you don't fall. There used to be nails sticking up out of them. Well, they still do. <laughs> 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 I took the circle out of my, out of my heel on this you know? <laughs> What the heck? You have to never remember where it's at. It's like it moves every day. Yeah, you got to go there and feel for them. But I check them now. But <coughs> you you know exactly what they were going through because they took what was comfortable and they set it aside and they were like, "We want something else." 
And then when they got to that something else, they was like, holy crap, what do we do? And God said, come on up here. Read it. He says, come on up here. And they went, nope, you go. The very first time God says it, they were all welcome to go. Every one of them, all two million, 200,000, two million, how many there were. They went, no. <laughs> Did you hear the thunder and see the lightning? Things are shaking. I'm freaking out. Isn't that in Exodus yeah, okay. or is that Genesis? It's in Exodus, I believe. Oh. It's in Exodus. Yeah, Genesis don't have uh, the story of the yeah, it's... departure from Egypt. And they say, nope, you go. And when, no, and when Moses gets up there and he's like, you're the only one that came? <laughs> well, from now on, nobody else can see me now. That's when God says that. Kind of made, he oh, kinda, he offered all of you to come Yes, up here. he said, come on up here. I haven't read that. It was the people. It was all of the people that were afraid, and they were like, no, we're not going. Yeah, we're not going. Oh, Bobby started a barbecue, man, go. <laughs> like, I, we got peeled taters and stuff, bro. You ain't doing nothing right now. <laughs> you go. Go on, man. Here. And like, they're like, <laughs> what do you mean you can't reach the edge? Here, boosting him up. <laughs> they were scared, bro. They were. And Moses was like, fine, I'll go. And he was up there for 40 days, and they got. They were like, wait a minute. Where'd he go? Now he's gone. You know what I mean? But he came back down with the law. That was God's way. If you think about all that Old Testament stuff, it was God's way of trying to, it was God's way of trying to show them how to think. And, but see, back then, they didn't even have a word for brain. In the Old Testament, there's no word for brain. That's why in Deuteronomy, when it says God is the God of one, you're supposed to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. In the New Testament, Jesus adds mind to that. In the New Testament, Matthew, Jesus says, what's the first law? To love God, you love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. They didn't have a word for So, like, he's, like, trying to show them that's why they had all the laws about eating animals. He wanted to make sure they didn't get sick and die. That's why. Go live in the wild. You can't eat what he told them not to eat, or you're dead. Right? And if they did the things that he was telling them to do, their mindset, their heart set, the way they treated each other, would have been picturesque, right? But they couldn't do it. They couldn't go 40 days without building a giant gold cow. <laughs> How much gold would they have? Dude, think about that. It says, it says, he, they took their necklaces off and built a 14 ton statue of gold. Yeah, the Egyptians gave it to them. They were like, man, y'all are crazy. Here, like Debo, <laughs> take it, go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They built a gold cow out of it. And Moses' brother built it. Which is interesting because Aaron became the first priest of Levi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Levi. Still, honored still honored him, right? Yeah. Moses even had to bow down and say, You're, he said, well, yeah. he said, they're building a cow down there. Uh, so <laughs> sit right here for a minute. We're going to start from scratch. And Moses says, the God I know wouldn't do that. And then Aaron brought the next generation to the land of the Hanan came in. Aaron didn't go. No, nope, Aaron did not see the promised land. <clears throat> Joshua. Joshua. I don't know. Horse. Because they didn't have, they had camel. Who would build a camel? Like, man, think about how ugly a camel is. Think about a bull when you see it. You know, yeah. the Chicago bulls. Yeah. Rodeos. A cow. <laughs> That the thing in Mexico where they run from them, the running of the bulls. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like yeah, a cat, uh, like a, but then the a camel. Where I go, ah, I go. Who would you know what I mean? The addition course of what? And well, why did they, did they uh, worship a cat? The cats were the guardians of the underworld. Right. Okay. Right. Egyptians worshipped everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Well, cats. I mean, everything. Anubis was dull. Cut this off. Man, I love you guys.